Okay, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be back uh, at the course. I hope you had a, an interesting week so far. I think there's still uh, one day to go, but I hope you learned a lot already. Um, what I'll try to, to do this morning uh, in the next uh, hour or 50 minutes is to try to put the methods that you're learning that allow us to measure proteins in highly reproducible ways and quantitatively accurately in some biological context. So, let me start with this slide. The, I think the big difference from the techniques we are learning this week and discussing is that it is now possible or it allows us, it allows us to do uh, and to generate data sets which look like a matrix. And this matrix would be samples, these are biological samples, and then, and then on the y-axis here are proteins that are measured and identified and quantified in each one of the samples. So this is, of course, nothing new for analytical sciences. And those who also use genomic techniques, such as next generation sequencing for transcripts or expression arrays uh, for, to measure transcripts. For those, this is nothing new. For proteomics, this, is, this has been very challenging for many of the reasons that were discussed uh, during this week. And the targeting techniques that um, were developed and are still evolving very quickly now allow us to generate such data matrices. So these are technical advances, and mostly we talked about technical advances mostly from the point of view of the uh, computational analysis and also some of the data acquisition techniques. I would like to, this morning, discuss some of the implications for biologists, experimental biologists, who have now such data in principle accessible. So it's only one slide I show about some instrumentation or techniques. That's just to put this in perspective and to say that we are using to, for, the, for the generation of these um, data matrices, we use mass spectrometry. And we use the techniques that were discussed this week, targeting techniques, and particularly we use in, in our group uh, very extensively a fast conversion of tissue or cell samples into peptides using a pressure cycler, um, which is, makes this quite reproducible and fast, but it, of course, is not a precondition to use a pressure cycle. cycle. We just think it's, a, it's an adva advantageous instrument. And then we use a mass spectrometer. Typically, we use a triple TOF mass spectrometer that generates both data sets, or we use a, a, a Q-trap or a, or a triple quadrupole instrument to generate SRM-based uh, data sets. So this, um, I don't need to explain more because this was, everyone is very familiar with these techniques. So now I would like to get into some biological questions. And first I would like to start uh, and by stating how we, or kind of reviewing how we are trained as biologists to do, uh, to do experiments. And we, we, we're trained to basically do an experiment in a very complicated context for very complicated questions and to do one variable, to vary one variable at a time. So we have some, for instance, something very complicated like a mouse. And we would keep as many variables as we can constant. For instance, the strain, the, gen the genotype of this mouse, the time of day, the food state, the temperature, microbes may be in the cage, maybe we even prefer to have no microbes in the cage. So we try to control as much as possible around this mouse, and then we will do one change. We may be, we add a drug, or we delete a gene, or we introduce a mutation, or do some other perturbation, and then we do some measurements. And this is, your, this is the experiment. You basically take an invariant system, we introduce one change, and then we do measurements. In our case, these are preferably proteomic measurements. And then we make some finding. We might, for instance, see if this mouse has been added with a drug 
it will, for instance, get fever, or, or it might walk faster, or, or it might go to sleep, or whatever. And then we do measurements at the molecular level, and, and also measure what it does to the phenotype. And then we generalize these findings to all the mice in all conditions. And then we write a paper. If we were, if we were to write um, that this particular treatment was done in this mouse at this particular time, and only valid for this mouse, we could not publish a paper. So people assume that what we find in such experiments have some gen general va uh, validity. So now, how, this, how is this in, in, reality? in reality? In reality, we know, of course, if you go outside, there's very different. There's many mice, um, and they're all different. They're, and it's exactly like a human population. Each individual is different genotypically. And so these, there, there are um, f uh, experiments or studies, like from the, this is a study from the uh, NSF in the US, where a whole range of strains were uh, genotyped, and also to some extent uh, uh, phenotyped. So they're very different from each other, uh, exactly as a human population, a human population individuals would be different. So there is, a, there is a, a large, large efforts ongoing to characterize strains. I'll come back to this uh, a little bit later in the talk. I think from the purpose of this discussion at this point is there is no reference mouse, there is no universal uh, consortium of biologists to say, if you do experiments in a mouse, use this mouse at this time of day, at this temperature uh, after it has eaten that much. So there is variability. Um, there is no reference state. Uh, some people would use a different mouse at a different time to do exactly the same experiments that others are doing. So I think it's fair to say that all results are conditional on the genotype, but also on other conditions that this particular animal encounters. So for sure, the mice are different, and they're also likely act to act differently. So this is an example of this. This is um, from collaboration we're doing with a group of Johan Overks at, um, at, at uh, EPFL in Lausanne. And uh, there we, we work with mice, which I'll come back to. These are specifically constructed mouse strains, which have certain properties which I'll explain. So these are just two mice here, um, Black 6 and DBA. These are frequently used laboratory strains. And what the laboratory of Johan Overks is doing, and in fact many other laboratories, they measure phenotypes, molecular phenotypes or, or other phenotypes. So here, for instance, they, they measured from these two mice that they, uh, that they, uh, how much, um, how, how athletic, how fit are they. This, if anyone who goes to the fitness club will probably have measured their own VO2 max, that's basically how much oxygen you can burn as, a, as an individual. And of course, this oxygen uh, basically also determines then the amount of oxygen you can burn determines your, your fitness output. So we see here that these two mice, they're measured in in nor after they've been eating normal food or eating high-fat diet for a, for a while, for several weeks, we see that these two strains, um, they, they are pretty similar here in terms of VO2 max, so they're equally fit. Uh, when they eat for a long time high-fat diet, they get less fit, but, and they also don't get less fit to the same extent. So clearly, the, everything else being equal, the, the genotype of these mice has an effect on how they react to the uptake of high food diet over a time in their, in res with respect to their fitness. There's another phenotype here, doesn't really matter what it is, but here the two mice are always substantially different. Even if they, in, in, if they eat normal food, they are relatively similar um, if they eat high fat uh, food. So this is just to illustrate that this idea that individual mice or individuals in a human population are different, um, basically uh, is, is manifests itself at the genomic level, but it also manifests itself at the phenotypic level. And of course, we would like to connect the, the two together. So how can we, how we, can we do that? So I'm trying, trying to come up with some picture. How this might, how we could imagine that this would work, which could also guide some experimentation. So, uh, this, is a, this is a sailboat uh, that everyone can see. And this is a particular thing about this sailboat, is it's, it's referred to as a construction class. 
So basically, this is an interesting experiment by naval architects, because someone comes up with a formula. And this formula is written here, and this formula has a number of variables that, that, uh, uh, that then can be varied by the naval architect, like the length, the sail area, and, and so on. It doesn't really matter what it is. But at the end, the, every boat that is built within this class has to come up with a certain number of meters here, and this would be an eight meter class boat. So this doesn't mean that the boat is eight meters long, it simply means that these variables here can be chosen by the naval architect, so in, in, in deliberate ways, it can make the boat very long, but it has little sail, or it can make it short, but it has gigantic sail. So there is, there is flexibility in this, within this formula, but the answer has always to be eight meters. And so there's, there's actually one can go into the internet or in the harbor, there's beautiful boats like that, that, that they're different um, in their appearance, they all conform to this formula, so they're and then the question is, um, how do we test whether, whether the naval architect has been uh, successful in building a good boat? And this might be a race, so the, the boat is tested in a race under specific conditions. And I think the important thing we are trying to use with this analogy is that the boat, this one boat here, which conforms to the formula, might be very fast under extremely light conditions, light wind conditions, but it might be terrible if there is, a, there is heavy wind and it may simply have way too much um, sail. So what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is there is uh, there's some variables. They can be tested against the fitness of the boat, basically. The naval architect plays around to find the optimum for certain conditions, and this is the test detected in a race. Basically, this is in detected in selection. So, in a, in a way, these, these animals that we're looking at here, these mice, are operating in a, similar, um, in a similar scenario. Except they don't have four variables, they have, if we believe in, ge in the genetics, roughly 20,000 20, independent variables. These are, these are all these genes. They all somehow have influence on each other. They all interact with each other, like the sail length and the, and the, the sail area and the length of the boat are not independent, they have dependencies or, on, or create dependencies on each other. So basically what we would like to do if you want to understand such an, an mouse and how it reacts, how the a genotypic change in the building plan affects the fitness or the, the phenotype, we would need to generate some form of formula which has 20,000 variables which are somewhat in, in, interdependent. So if we, if we, if we kind of uh, accept this view, then you will probably see immediately that if you have so many variables and they are even, that even um, dependent on each other, it is essentially a, uh, a, a ludicrous idea to say we're going to test any variable um, uh, individually as we conventionally have been doing experiments. Because we will never get to an end and it actually was also meaningless because the type of mutation you might induce, a variable you might induce in one strain, might have a completely different effect if you introduce this variable in another strain. So if we, if we, if we assume that we would like to learn how this, um, how this um, system actually functions and how, we can, how a particular phenotype is being created by generating mutations deliberately in each one of these elements and doing systematic variability and testing the effects on, that, on, that, on the fitness of this phenotype, I think will we'll be uh, basically run aground. It simply won't work because there's too many factors, there's too many interdependencies. There's no single solution. Optimum, condi optimum is condition dependent, exactly as in this construction class sailboat. So in this scenario, varying va one variable at a time is neither useful nor is it feasible. And so this is then um, what the um, uh, what, what what one needs to somehow be able to overcome. And one suggestion that comes from computer scientists, um, and I'll come back to this towards the end then, where how valid this is uh, in, in, re in reality, is that we don't worry about the effect of a particular variable on, on the system. And we don't do systematic experiments, but we basically collect large amounts of data. And the connection of this to this, of this um, point of view to the course is, of course, that we now can, 
with mass spectrometric techniques that we discussed this week, generate the very large data sets which actually are meaningful to, to feed into the, the tools of computer science. So what this um, author here said is the, um, the scientific method, which is exactly to, to, to synthesize or, or come up with a hypothesis to make a, a change in a system and then predict what this change would be causing and then testing whether this is actually happening, that this is largely obsolete. And, um, and so they, they, they said here, the author said, that uh, we're trained to recognize that correlation is not causation, that no conclusion should be drawn simply on the basis of correlation, and that we should do experiments. That's how we're trained. And I, with this mouse and this boat uh, study or, or analogy, I just indicated that this is, is probably um, not going to work for very complicated systems. So then he says, we, sh we have now massive amounts of data, in our case preferably including proteomic data, so we, we should no longer use this method, but we should just use correlations. And this is of course what um, Google is doing, what big shops like Amazon are doing, that they learn out of big data on the behavior of, or, of certain uh, groups of customers to make predictions what they also uh, might buy. And here we would like to do this uh, using this data to make predictions how a system might behave based on past experience uh, without knowing all the molecular details. So this is the, the, the tool. We have dependent variables. We observe, um, we observe an object and we, we can basically make correlations. We can do this now with proteins uh, because we have this data available. So this is the first summary what I tried to show so far. Basically, this is how we think proteomics data sets through the techniques we now learned can contribute to, um, to open new avenues in biological experimentation. That experiments that control one variable at a time among many are limiting because they do not show um, complex dependencies. So this is the classical uh, experimental approach where everything is kept constant and you introduce one variable. These experiments also do not scale. Generalization of results across conditions is not justified because we, we would always have to specify under what conditions the result was obtained. And the mutation and subsequent selection of phenotypes is a powerful concept for experimental biology of complex processes because it, the, the, the selection constraints that is the search space. And then we would, we would now conclude that big data, samples versus protein data sets are the currency for association studies and we can now generate them. The question of course is, are such associations actually biologically informative? Do they really tell us something about a biological system, uh, a complex system, a complex phenotype that we did not know before? And, and do they tell us something that the mechanistic uh, biologist has not been able to find? So now I have an example where we test this, uh, where, we, where we test some of these assumptions. And this is a collaboration between our group. Um, the data were generated by Alex Ebhardt and the group of Ernst Hafen uh, with mostly Hiro Okata and Sibyl Fonash, who did um, the student, or she was a student here, she's now a postdoc, who did phenotypic measurements. So the question we asked here is how how, if we have a phenotype that is highly, highly selected, so that means that if there is a variability in this phenotype, the animal that expresses that phenotype will almost certainly die. And if there is genomic variability um, that is occurring in this species, in different individuals, we, we wanted to ask how is this genomic variability buffered to lead to a phenotype that is fairly constant. It is, as we'll see, it's not, a, it's not a identical, but it is highly, highly constrained through selection. The phenotype is size. So this is, of course, um, in, a, in a human case, we have individuals which are very large, and their individuals are not, so, are not so large. And we assume, because we can do this, we can follow this in twin studies, 
that there is a strong genetic component to determining the size of the individual. It's not entirely genetic, but it is, certainly has a genetic component. So what scientists usually do is they measure SNPs, sequence variants, and they associate these variants with a phenotype. So you would, you would, for instance, select a number of very large individuals, a number of, sh of shorter individuals, and then you try to, to do geno genotype analysis and try to relate these SNPs to the phenotype, and then you would find genes that have some effect on the, uh, are associated with the size. So this is, this is of course, done ex very, very extensively. You'll see here that there's no proteins, and we think, so well, since now we have the ability to measure proteins, that this genotypic variation is somehow translated into protein variation. We refer to this as prototype variation, which then is biochemically translating the information in the genome and the variants of thereof into phenotype. So we cannot do this really in humans, um, so we try to, to address this question in, uh, in, in flies. The study was the following. A person, Judy McKay, she caught wild-type Drosophila in a fruit market and made inbred lines. So these are flies, Drosophila mel melanogaster, uh, little fruit flies. They always appear when there is some food, uh, fruit around, and, they can, and she caught them and then she made uh, lines. Um, Sibyl measured the wing size of these um, of these uh, strains, the animals from these strains, and and of course, and we chose wing size because it's highly selected. Flying for a fly is extremely difficult, and if there is a difference in the wing, or the wing is too big, too not moving enough, to have weird shape, the fly will not be able to fly, and not flying for a fly basically means it's dead. I mean, it gets eaten, it cannot find food. So it's a highly selected phenotype, and the group here generated a genotypic um, maps that genotyped all these flies, uh, all these strains, and it's highly variable. So it's about one, one in 40 basis a SNP. This is a remarkable finding, because in our, within a human populations, about one in 1,000 uh, nucleotides is, is different. Here it is, it's much more variable, much more variability. And then, so we measured, this is Sibyl's work, measured, um, she measured the, the, the size and the shape, and um, Alex, Ebhard and Hero measured the um, proteome of this wing, wing disc. These are cells that are put aside to determine then or become the wing in the adult fly, and we correlate the two. So this is simply the, um, how the, mi the mice were generated. This is in, uh, the mice, the, the flies were generated in 2012, and they caught these flies and then bred them for 20 generations. They're, they're, they're homogeneous. Each strain is homogeneous, but is is like a wild type fly, and they're different from each other. So the advantage, of course, here is that you can have from each strain, you can have multiple, multiple copies, which you cannot do in humans, and then you can measure also the variability within one genotype and its dependence on the environment. Okay, so this is what Sibyl measured. So this, there is morphometric ways to, to measure the, the, the size of these wings. They can be you can measure the area, you can measure the width, you can measure the length, you can measure how, how, how certain substructures in these. So you have a lot of information about uh, that is basically a, a phenotypic expression. So here we already see, we already see that these would be strains here, the x-axis, each dot is one is fly, flies from one strain. We see that they are, they're, they're not identical, they're also that the, um, that the um, the males are actually somewhat smaller in, their, in the wing size and the females, and that there is a range of phenotypes that it can be quantitatively measured. And of course, if, if all were exactly the same, then we couldn't really do anything. So the SNP density is enormous, I already mentioned that. Um, and then what, this is what we try to do. We, we would try to fill in here this enormous leap from genomic variability to phenotype, we try to now fill in measurements at the protein level. So the experiment was to select so far um, 15 small wing lines, 15 big wing lines, then grow, then grow larvae, so they, they don't actually express the, the, the wings yet, then select the, the cells out that will lead to the wing, these uh, wing imaginal disks, and then these were dissected by Hero, 
And then uh, we extracted proteins and analyzed these proteins by, uh, by Swarth mass spectrometry. And then did the, the data analysis types that you um, learned this week. This is the data. So these are, there's actually not many cells. It's about 1,000 cells are in such a disk. So it's a relatively challenging experiment. And um, we were able to obtain about 2,000 proteins, uh, close to 10,000 peptides are quantified across these strengths. So these would be big wing females, big wing males, small wing females, small wing males. So now we have a data set that we can, and so we have basically the genotypic information, we have this protein information, um, and we have the, the, wing in the wing size morphometric information, which is expression of the phenotype. And we can now ask, for instance, how is the variability from the genome, which is enormous, it, how is this, how is this how is this variability propagated to the level of proteins? Um, because if we would assume that if enormous variability exists in the wings, this, that the flies would, would die, because the wings would be largely dysfunctional. So we assume that there's some buffering ongoing, and we can also ask how do specific genes affect the abundance of specific proteins? This is quantitative trait locus analysis, QTL analysis. And we can also ask, collectively, do we find in this, in this data clusters of proteins or functional groups, which, which always so kind of functions, higher order functions, biochemical functions, that associate with large or small wing size. So I'll come back to some of these questions. But first, before you can analyze any of these um, or, or answer any of these questions, you have to ask, is what we see as, these, as differences here, as red and blue in this matrix, is this actually a biological signal or is this simply measurement noise? And so this is, um, this, this is basically a plot to show, um, to show that we see biological signal uh, because between we, 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 qu we quantified the difference, or plotted here the difference um, uh, of these uh, correlation coefficients when non-replicates and, and replicates were, uh, were compared. And we can see that the... Um, Biological replicates are these um, kind of darker, dark, darker violet um, correlations. They correlate str more strongly with each other. That means the, the, protein the protein patterns from biological replicates of the same samples look more similar to each other in this proteome map than if we take uh, the different strengths. This is, of course, what we would expect, but it's an, it's an indication that the difference of these two distributions is actually biological signal. Because that's the difference between the two distributions, is in one case the genotype is variable and the other type is not. So the samples are highly related and there is a small biological signal that can be detected through the quantitative accuracy of the method. So then um, Hero did a variety of statistical analysis to find protein groups or functions that are carried, biological functions are carried out by protein groups that associate with um, this wing, with, with, this, with the size and morphoma, morphometry of the, of the ring, of the, wi of the wing. And, if, and if we find segregation of wing size associated proteins. So we basically now take out of these 2,000 or so proteins, proteins which have a correlation not necessarily a causal correlation, at this, uh, not causal relationship at this time, but with, with that associate with, with, long, with large or small disks. And then we can ask, since we of course know what these proteins are doing, because they have a name, they have a biological or biochemical function, we can ask which functions are represented by the proteins that are associated with a large or a small wing disk. So we basically now go from enormous genotypic variability we have a highly selected phenotype, and we ask, how is this genotypic variability constrained, or which functions are affected in the cell, that, and that determine ultimately whether, it's, whether the, the wing is larger or smaller. So we find a number, of, um, a number of such processes that are highly enriched in the proteins that show the interesting pattern. This is my, mitosis cell cycle, glycolysis, chromosomal 
um, proteins, histones, and mitochondrial respiration. So this is an interesting finding because um, there has been hundreds of papers published that are studying the signaling pathways that are induced, for instance, insulin, recept insulin receptor TOR signaling um, that, that, is, that is required to induce the mechanisms, that the, the, the signaling mechanisms that lead to large or smaller body sizes, including uh, the, wing, the, the wing in the fly. What we find here, we have also find some of the signaling systems, but we find that there is a subtle change in the, in the energy landscape. So there is a shift from glycolysis to mitochondrial respiration, or the other way around, which strongly associates with the wing disk size. And we find a subtle change in chromosomal, in chromosomal protein, basically histone packing, that is also associated with this wing disk size. So this is um, the picture that is emerging, which, uh, which to us was really a surprising picture. And, and actually an, in, an interesting one for also for medical, um, for reasons of, medi of medicine, as we'll come back uh, in a minute. So we find that this enormous variability, it is variability is strongly buffered here at the prototype. The proteins levels of these wings look very similar, but not identical. And then there is groups of proteins which correlate in their fun in function, but also in abundance, with with the large or big or small phenotype. And these are not randomly distributed over the overall biochemical landscape of the cell, but they affect um, certain shifts, relatively subtle shifts, in the physiology of the cell. So we, we see that, for instance, in the, in the wing size is up, the big wings, glucose, its meta metabolism is up, and mitochondrial respiration is down. So these are subtle changes, maybe 10, 20%. So basically, it seems that there is a signaling signaling system in the cell that, make, that senses certain nutrients, maybe, and there's also genetic components, and the, effect, the net effect of this is a slight shift, or a, a, a slight shift from glucose metabolism to mitochondrial respiration, and that affects the, the, the wing size. We see a specific transcriptional factor which induces histones, and we see that if this, is, if, if this factor is down, this is, so, is associated with small, with small wings, and we also see some pro proteins from the signaling area that like TOR signaling, which is, which is nice and confirmatory with lots of the, dis of the, of the uh, literature. So well, to summarize what we see here, or what, I, what I showed, is that we chose a highly selected phenotype in the fly, the wing disk size. We measured the variation of the wing disk proteins and with, with mass spectrometry techniques that we discussed this week. The protein expression is very robust, very small change between these, um, between these flies, so there's a very extensive buffering of this genomic uh, variability at the level of proteins, and we can, we can find a number of key factors, like these proteins here, which are tuning um, as, as regulators very big and very essential big pr processes in the cell, like the energy production of ATP away from respiration to glycolysis or away from glycolysis to respiration. Uh, and, and this um, is, of course, an interesting finding. So now this particular case was one where we had um, a, um, a situation where the animals that were selected were randomly variable. They were wild-type animals. And we, had, we chose a phenotype that is very, very highly selected. Normally, phenotypes are not highly selected, certainly not in the human population. And so it is, of course, a, a big question in the field of medicine, for instance, in the field of personalized medicine, where now enormous amounts of, of genotypic information are being generated to next generation sequencing. And at some level, we would need to understand how all this variability is translated into phenotypes in the case of, of, for instance, disease phenotypes. If we cannot resolve these questions, then the, 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 the nucleic acid sequence and the enormous wealth of information is extremely difficult to interpret. And today, of course, this is mostly done exactly as in these fly cases by just associating SNPs through genome-wide association studies with specific phenotypes. 
And we just learned in this case of the fly that there is a lot of underlying biology and that the biochemical mechanisms, fundamental biochemical mechanisms, are tuned to slightly increase or slight decrease of their performance, and that this is really causing or, so, or strongly uh, is, is, is the biochemical basis for, for these phenotypes we see. So we would like to, of course, if we want to be operational in this arena of personalized medicine, we would also need to go beyond um, just measuring genomes and associate them through GWAS with phenotypes. We would like to get some bio biochemical insights, and we'd like to do this at the level of proteins. But we don't have these enormous constraints, so the, the phenotypes can be basically very highly variable. So we, we did, we, we, we're working with a group of Johan Nowerks, and now I'm showing some results from Yibo Wu, who generated the data, and from Evan Williams, um, who, where we tried to explore this um, same question, how is phenotypic variation um, translated into phenotypic variation? But we do this now in a case where we don't work with outbred animals. We have kind of an intermediate stage where there is also variability, but the variability is constrained. Because we think that by going to an entirely outbred situation, the variability will be so difficult to explain and is so enormous that it will be very difficult to find some patterns. So the question we want to ask, how do, in an animal like a mouse, how do genotypes, different genotypes, which can be measured, relate to, these, to phenotypes, for instance, those affected with the disease and, and those are not, and how do we go from here to here beyond just SNP associations? So how, is this, how are they related, these two sides? The classical notions that we learn in undergrad biology is that there is one gene, one protein, one function, a concept from the 1940s, which basically says that if there is a locus here that produces a protein, this protein has a biochemical function, and this protein uh, then causes, if carries out a function which may cause a phenotype. We also learn from slightly, a slightly younger concept that mutations in one gene or one protein can cause a phenotype in the classical example is sickle cell anemia, where a specific one single amino acid change in a, in a hemoglobin chain causes a disease that can be measured in, is, is occurring in human sickle cell anemia, famous uh, work uh, from Linus Pauling. Okay, but clearly they don't, these, these um, concepts are not sufficient uh, when we go to a, a disease like cancer. So this is a data that were from a, one of the early cancer genomic studies. And this were, the study was to select a number of patients, several hundred, slightly more than 300, that all have the same disease based on a, on a pathologist. So they all have ovarian cancer. From each one of these patients, the tumor, uh, as, as part of a tumor, was selected. And a part of normal tissue from that individual was also selected and then genomically sequenced. And then you can, of course, you can then add up the mutations that occur within one person between the normal genome and the disease genome, and you can add up the mutations that occur between the, the individuals in this uh, tested population. And so this has now been done many times over for different uh, cancers, uh, oncology diseases, and what we see is always the same picture with some, with some slight variation. We see that there's an enormous number of mutations, thousands, sometimes even tens of thousands, that occur in the, are detected in this study that differentiate the healthy from the cancer uh, genome in, this per in these individuals, not even taking into account the background variability. We see that there's always a number, a relatively small number, of mutations that affect, or, or genes that are affected by, uh, in a relatively large fraction of these individuals in this population. And we see there's a very large number of genes or mutations that are mutated uh, in a very small fraction of this population that is being, um, that is being tested. So usually, these high frequently, highly frequently mutated genes are the oncogenes we already know. Something like P10, uh, P53, RAS, they're frequently occurring here. And, this, and, and, and biologists have great difficulty to explain the significance of these mutations, uh, of those large number of mutations, which clearly occur in, this, in diseased tissue, uh, and to explain their biological significance. 
So usually then, these mutations are grouped into driver mutations, which are thought to be uh, drivers of the progression of the disease, and passengers, which are just coincidentally occurring, because uh, usually tumors are um, genomically instable. So if we now go back to these classical notions, um, one gene, one protein, one function, or Linus Pauling's notion of sickle cell anemia, we would have to find a way to say, okay, how do these mutations here that we find, how can we translate them into altered functions, for instance, also altered structures of proteins? And this, of course, simply through the sheer number is very difficult, but it's also difficult for conceptual reasons because these mutations are not directly by themselves causal. And we see that it's by that very few, if any, reach a penetrance of 100%. That means that they're not present, the mutation are causing mutation, will not be present in every patient. And conversely, the presence of a cancer mutation, let's say P53, does not necessarily mean, or BRCA1, in the case of breast cancer, does not necessarily mean that the person actually gets the disease. So this, it's, it's, a, it's a factor of the background uh, genome, the background proteome, how this information is processed. So to explain this complicated situation that we, we have difficulty associating the genomic lesions that are being detected with a, with a, with a phenotype um, to, and to mechanistically explain how this works. A number of terms have been uh, developed by genetics uh, uh, community and the clinical community. Uh, so these would be terms would be penetrants, gen <coughs> variable expression, allelic, allelic heterogeneity, epistasis, and so on. And we don't need to belabor them, but a number of terms have been de defined and are used to basically explain how this genomic variability is associated with, with phenotype. So penetrance, for instance, means that um, a particular trait is expressed in a person uh, or in a population, but not everyone will show the phenotype. Some do and some don't, which is very common in, um, in, in gene uh, genomics-dependent um, uh, diseases. So the fact is that we can pose a, very, a few very simple questions, and we have great difficulty to answer them. So we can, for instance, ask, what is the effect of any inherited or somatic mutation on a phenotype? So we could take a yeast or a mouse or a human genome, and you could introduce, and now actually experimentally introduce, not in a human, but of course, but of course in a mouse or a fly or a yeast, you could introduce a specific mutation. And if you understand the biochemical processes, you would be able to say, if I do something over here, what's the effect over there? And I think there would be very few, if any biologist would, would say, I can do this, make this prediction in the general terms. We could also ask how do two or more independent mutations combine? This is a very frequent occurrence, for instance, in oncology, as I just showed in this slide from the, um, from the ovarian cancer, where um, we, we clearly see that many mutations are concurrently occurring in different combinations in, in patients. So we would like to predict how the two or more of these independent mutations combine to a phenotype. Maybe they are synergistic, maybe the one is neutral, maybe they compensate for each other. And how do this, the same inherited mutation affect different individuals within, uh, within uh, with different genotypes is also an unresolved question of, highly important, of high importance, of course, for personalized medicine when mutations occur, but the background information, the background genotype is different in, in, except in identical twins. So basically, I think we, the scientific community um, developed a large number of terms with very precise definitions but we, 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 with these very simple questions that we can ask, and where we're really lacking an answer, we say, basically, we don't really know how it works uh, in, in detail. And so we, we, we would like to use an, a somewhat contrived genomic, ver uh, genomic um, variability situation to start to answer such questions. Namely, if what happens, what's the contribution of specific mutations to, to a phenotype, and for that, we use a, uh, the results of a large consortium. This is the BXD consortium. This is, we have nothing to do with that. We just gratefully use the fruits of their labor. 
and this is a really fantastic resource. So they basically create about, created about 150 inbred mice, uh, lines of mice, and the B stands for black six, D stands for DBA. These are the two mice I already used once in the earlier in this talk. And they were genotyped, they have about 5 million sequence variants, which of course are, since all these, all these strains are, uh, are in inherently uh, identical, the individuals in one strain, but different from across strains, but they are different in a way that um, they're not randomly different, they basically have the variability of the two founder mice, the two parents, distributed uh, through, uh, my, through my meiosis and recombination across their offspring. So we basically have a situation where there is about uh, 150 uh, strains, which are identical, we have multiple copies of these in individual mice, and they are genetically like brothers and sisters. And these are available for experimentation. Now, interestingly enough, they were, this is just how they were bred by this consortium, the BXD consortium, this is a paper that describes this uh, generation of these strains. And they have been genotyped, but also have been extensively phenotyped. So a lot of things are measured on these mice, and this is, for instance, done in the lab of Johan Overx in Lausanne. So now what do we find? I already showed this slide here before. And these were the two parents. We, we saw that they are reacting to some extent to environmental perturbations. We showed that they are inherently in some phenotypes the same, but re react differently. We had some strains which are different in their, in their no a normal food, but they then look very similar in if they eat high-fat diet. Now we can ask this across this gen the whole um, group of genotypes. And this is really interesting because it... it um, uh, what, what we see. So we use the same code here, same phenotypes, and we use the same code. This is low-fat diet, this is high-fat diet food, and this is the same, this is the VO2 max, it's basically the fitness. We see that the, as we expect here, the two parent strains are in this phenotypic map here together. They are very similar, and they're different in the, um, if they have eaten high-fat high diet. So this is exactly what we've seen before. But now we project these phenotype, phenotypic measurements in the whole distribution of their offspring of these, of these two parents. And, this, and the, of course, very interesting thing is that these parents are, are not uh, really representative for the whole distribution. There's a wide distribution of phenotypes also here, and that the parents are somewhere in the middle. So the parents generate offspring that have a phenotype by mi mixing the genotypes together um, in, through breeding, um, they generate offspring which have genotypes which are quite far outside the range that is given from the parents. This is obviously the sign of a complex system because if we had simple Mendelian progression, inheritance of this trait, then we would, we would not see that. We would see that we have a range that's defined by the parents and the offspring would be either like one or the parent or the other or, or somewhere in the middle. So this is clearly an indication of the complexity of these traits. So uh, Yibo Wu, together with, um, in our group, together with um, Evan Williams in Jan Overx's group, Evan is now also here, uh, did an experiment to test some of these, some of these, um, uh, some of these relationships between the genotype and phenotypes in these in these mice, and so they measured um, the selected mice, 40 strains out of the 150, um, grew them in so these are genotypic axes, they're genetically different, and then grew them in normal food or in high food diet, is kind of an environmental axis, and then selected animals at a certain amount of a certain age. And, and extracted livers, we now also do different tissues, and asked what, what is the variability of the proteome and the transcriptome for that matter. Um, in these animals and how is this variability affected by environmental causes? So this is, this is basically doing uh, an experiment like one would do in personalized medicine, but under much, much constrained uh, conditions where the variability is constrained, the experimental um, we can do re replicates, and we, can, we understand the uh, genomic variability, and we can, of course, maintain certain variables constant, like age 
or uh, gender of the animal. Okay, so there, there were, um, this is actually a case of SRM. You know, I've done also this, or Ibo has done this with um, Ms. Voss, but I show some data from a small data set, 192 proteins. For SRM, it's a large data set, but now we have data uh, which is at least uh, uh, an order of magnitude better. But I would also like to show, I specifically chose the SRM data, not the SWOS data here, because I would like to show that if with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a nicely structured experiment, even with a relatively low number of proteins, we can gain a lot of new insights into, the bi into biology. So Yibo and Evan selected 192 proteins, roughly centered around metabolism, did three technical replicates and three biological replicates, just to, again, see what is the, what is the reliability of the data, which is very high, and just to determine whether we can see biological signal in this, in this somewhat noisy data set, but actually the noise is quite low. This is the um, heat map, 192 proteins, uh, quantifi uh, quantified across the 40, um, 40 strains. And this is done by SRM, and the protein abundance cal calculation were done by, by uh, SRM stats from, from Olga's uh, VTEX laboratory. So, you see that the protein variation within the same genotype is much smaller than the variation induced by genotype or diet, which is what we would expect. That basically means we can see biological signal. Now again, we, so now we have 192 proteins. They were carefully or somewhat carefully selected with some intent to learn something about biological processes. And we can now ask questions again, what, what do these proteins tell us, exactly as we could in the case of the flies? Um, and we can ask now, the, how, what, how does the variability of these proteins across all these conditions, um, how do the proteins co-vary? And this is basically a... Um, uh, this is basically a display of, of this type of analysis that was carried out. And we see that proteins within a pati particular processes um, that are covered by, by chemical processes covered by these proteins tend to, uh, tend to co-vary. That means they're probably functionally related. So in these processes are carbohydrate mechanism. Electron transport, again, has to do with... Um, with, um, uh, with, with with, uh, with energy, metabolism, and some other uh, factors. So this, the, I don't really want to want to belabor that because I want to get to something else, and that is the the big data slide that I showed just before. I mean the 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 uh, the, the obsoleteness of doing biochemical experiments. I would like to challenge this now with this story. So first, we can say now, since we have the proteins and we have the genomic variability, we can ask to what extent does or can we find relationships between the protein abundance and the particular genomic lo locus that is present. Because we know for each locus whether it, which allele is present in which mouse of the, of the 40 mice tested. So this is referred to as, as protein QTL, quantitative trait locus analysis. And Yibo and Evan detected 44 protein QTLs out of 190 plus proteins measured, um, and, and this is a fairly high fraction. So basically this means that we have 40 cases, where 44 cases, where a particular locus controls the abundance of, of a particular protein. Um, and some regulate themselves, and others regulate some other, some other uh, gene or some, the abundance of some other protein than the one coded for by the particular locus. So these are referred to as trans-QTLs. And some of these QTLs are food dependent. Now we can also ask, what is the relationship between these QTLs that are detected at the protein level and the transcript level? And, the, and the, uh, th that's an interesting question. And we're always faced with that in, pro in proteomics because a lot of people still believe that you basically just have to measure transcripts and then you know what biology happens. And again, without going into a a excruciating detail what each one of these QTL means, QTLs does, we can see that by the data analysis from this uh, across the same, now we measure the transcripts from these 192 genes 
or 97 genes which were measured by proteomics. We see a similar number of QTLs, so these were expression QTLs, these are transcripts, and these are proteins. So this, the number is quite similar. Of, of loci that are detected at the transcript or protein level to affect the expression of the respective molecule, the transcript or the protein. But what we see is, is that, the, that the, the relationship of how they act is very different. So about 80% of the EQTLs, the transcript QTLs, are cis-acting, that means they basically act on themselves. So the, the, the locus affects the abundance of the, of the transcript coded for or expressed by this particular gene. Whereas in protein level, these are the minority, and the majority is, is, um, is, is regulated in a more convoluted form. It does not con the locus it does not control the expression of its own product. So this clearly again indicates that the relationship of control of gene expression is very different at the level of proteins and the level of transcripts, and is more convoluted, more, there's I more indirect effects at the level of the um, proteins. So transcripts are more likely than proteins to be directly cis-regulated. Um, and then there is some uh, uh, observations on the, on the food, and 80% of QTLs are observed at transcript or protein level as relatively small overlap. So it's clearly different levels of regulation, uh, which is of course an interesting uh, observation. Now we, we wanted to say, at the beginning I showed this slide from the computer science uh, arena, we said experimentation and hypothesis-driven research is basically obsolete, because we can simply work with associations. We also showed then in both the case of the flies and these mice, that we do see associations. We see associations which are highly statistically significant, and, uh, but we do not really explain a cause. And what we now would like to, to see is if we use these protein measurements or different levels of, of measurement and try to reduce this down to a mechanistic level, whether these data are also useful to then fill in the mechanistic de detail. It's one thing to say that the, in, in, this, in the flies of, that have different wing size, there's a shift from uh, glycolysis to respiration. It's another thing to say exactly how mechanistically this happens, how is it controlled, and which enzymes are doing what to, uh, to, um, to do the shift. So we tried now to we now took some of these QTLs measured in EBOS and Evans data set and tried to fill in mechanistic detail. So one example is a QTL that affects this protein uh, down here, which basically, it's a complicated name, DHTKD1. It doesn't really matter what it does biochemically, but it, is, it matters what, uh, what it does in the context of, its, of, its, of the process it's involved in. So this is, a pro this is a process, a biochemical process, which is very well known, metabolic process, which degrades um, branched chain amino acids like lysine. So this, this lysine is degraded, like usually happens in metabolic pathways, in stepwise degradation. The blue entities, the, so this, the blue entities are enzymes, and the red entities here are intermediate products that are being generated and then are the substrate again for the next enzyme in this cascade. It happens that this protein that we find here, that we talk about, is at the very end of this pathway. So we can take a picture and say this is like a, a water hose, and you can constrain the hose by having less of the protein present, or you can open the water hose and you have more of the protein present. Uh, when, when you have more of the protein present, that, that means this enzyme down here constrains the flux of lysine being degraded through this, through this hose. So, and we, can, and we, we found a QTL, basically a locus, that affects the abundance of this protein here. And if you assume that the abundance is a reflection of the activity, we can basically have a locus, a genetic variant, that determines the abundance of this enzyme and therefore the flux of, that of, 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 um, of degradation through this pathway. So if this is correct, then we should, we should see that if we constrain down here, but the other enzymes up here are still equally active, they're not affected, that we should see a buildup of these intermediate products. 
And if the, if the hose is open, if the valve is wide open, there's a lot of flux, that is, that if there's a lot of protein present, con genetically controlled through the locus, then we should see low levels of these intermediate products because they don't pile up, they basically are processed in time. And that's exactly what we see. So here rank the, the enzyme levels, uh, expression levels, versus the amino adipators, these are these intermediate products, and they inversely correlate. That means if there's a lot of protein, there is little uh, metabolite. If there is little protein, there is high level of, of, of metabolite. So we now established through initially through large-scale association studies. It's not super large-scale in genomics terms, but from proteomic terms, it's reasonably large-scale. Uh, we establish a link between a geno genomic locus and the abundance of a protein. And then we establish, uh, since this protein can now be mechanistically placed in a particular pathway, we can establish a link between the level of the enzyme controlled by a particular locus with the level of specific intermediate metabolites. So we basically establish a mechanistic link between genetic variability, a genetic variant, an enzyme level, and some metabolites in the cell. So you might say, okay, that's fine, it's not super interesting, but it is super interesting because exactly this, this, re this, resi this uh, compound, amino adipic acid or amino ad adipate, is that that's the intermediate of this, if this um, pathway, which is controlled by the abundance level of the enzyme, is has been found in GWAS studies in the Framingham Heart cohort, which is a large long-term project, to be a, a biomarker for diabetes risk. So now, what, what we could establish here, through um, first large-scale or semi-large-scale association studies, very large-scale association studies at the phenotypic side, and mechanistic insights at the biochemical level, a link between a gene variant the, uh, that controls the abundance of a particular enzyme, and then this, the abundance of this enzyme controls, through enzyme action or constraining the flux through a system, the abundance of a particular metabolite. And this metabolite has a role, which is not certainly understood mechanistically again, uh, in, 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 in a co very complex disease. So from, from this and other such studies, we conclude that if we really would like to arrive at integrated quantitative models, which are clearly critical for personalized diagnostics, personalized intervention in the field of personalized medicine or medicine in general, or, or for that matter, for basic biology, then we, we cannot do this simply at the statistical level or the, the big data world. We, we, of course, can get hints. We can make get associations when we think that is that, as I showed in this last example, we can then learn a lot more when we so can somehow translate the insights from this large-scale data into, into mechanistic models on, or, or, or detailed analysis, for instance, also at the structural level or biochemi biochemical level. So this is, a, this, is a, this is a topic that we discussed very extensively over a long time with, with Olga, for instance, who always was skeptical that the law, that the law, that the Olga Vitek, that the, that the um, simply the use of associations would help us to gain a lot of insights. And I think these examples now are bearing out, this is a very small example, of course, but I think it's bearing out the notion that we now can use, um, or we should use, large-scale data approach, big data approaches in proteomics, but also small-scale data approach in mechanistic data and somehow combine them. And of course, the challenge will be to, to do this in, in a particular biological context. But I think through the tools we discussed this week, the targeted proteomics, we now have in proteomics the tools to, to do this actually at both levels. We can certainly do rather large scale uh, data sets. We can now run hundreds or soon probably thousands of samples and generate very nice data by DIA methods. And we can do, of course, relatively small numbers of proteins, very targeted in specific biological context. To summarize this third part, and then I'm done, the prototype is a biochemical Rosetta stone between genomic and, and phenomic language. We think it helps a lot to translate the genomic variability 
in biochemical terms into phenotypes if we understand what the proteins are doing, and not just what they're doing in the terms of their presence, but of course in terms of their function. The targeted proteomics generates data matrices that link loci to protein abundance, these PQTLs. I showed a few examples of that, lastly, in the context of this, um, um, of this two amino adipate story. Protein abundance changes linked by chemical functions to phenotype, which clearly demonstrated. Um, this is difficult for in a genetic reference panel and extremely challenging in an outbred population. So I think we have a lot to learn how to actually approach the cardinal questions of, of personalized medicine, like the three questions I posed in the slide before. How does a particular mutation interact with, for instance, another in the context of a phenotype, in a, of a particular genotype to cause a phenotype? And this has huge implications for personal medicine. We think that we should do a lot of basic research to really make this personalized medicine scenario a reality, and that this reality cannot be easily achieved by, by just associating genotypic variation with phenotypes because the biochemical foundation is missing. And ultimately, if one wants to, to therapeutically interfere with a pro disease process, one needs to know where to actually interfere uh, and, and how. Um, and I think a, an experimental point that I would like to make here is not the number of proteins that explain ni ni new biology, but rather the quality of the data set. And we think uh, of the, co the quality of the data. And I think in proteomics, we have been very long time preoccupied with generating longer and longer uh, lists or inventories of, 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 of protein inventories of samples. And I deliberately chose in this last example a relatively small data set for, for large scale, scale data world, SRM-based data, and they already showed us very interesting uh, biological information. So it's not the number, but it's the number of protein or s selected biologically relevant proteins measured across many conditions. That's what we believe, coming back to, to this graph. I think the advantage achieved and what we discussed this week is that we can now robustly generate these data matrices and I try to show what we can learn about the implications the availability of these data matrices for proteomics has for uncovering new biology. So thank you for attending the course. I hope that you um, learned new skills and that you can use these skills to make um, uh, interesting discoveries in biology. There's a lot to be discovered. I think it's just kind of getting interesting. And I would like to now again name the individuals whose work I represented. So a lot, is, a lot of the work we do is based on this SWOT technique, which is developed initially by Ludovic Schier and Pedro Navarro uh, in collaboration with Steve Tate um, and Ron Bonner at ab -Sci-X. And more recently, since Pedro moved on, um, Ben Collins, Yan Xu, uh, Yan Sheng, Lu, and George Rosenberger have been basically doing uh, a lot of this, of this work and they're on the, the development side. The Flywing Size Project is the work of Hiro Okada with Alex Ebhardt from our group and the Sibyl Fonesch and Ernst, and Ernst Hafen and Ernst Hafen's group who is a fly geneticist. And the BXD mouse project is the work of Yibo Wu and Evan Williams uh, in co a collaboration with Johan Overks. For the course, I would like to uh, also acknowledge funding from Systems X, this is a Swiss initiative for systems biology, which has consistently uh, supported this course. And um, I would also like to uh, acknowledge ETH, who actually makes the facilities here um, freely available. And this is, of course, a very generous uh, from uh, gesture from the school. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer some questions, if there are any. Yes? I would like to ask you, describe that uh, difficult, different uh, variants from population may arrive to different states and have completely different phenotype because of different set of proteins. And once you want to, want to understand the mechanism why this phenotype exists, we would like to find out these proteins, which potentially are different in each variant. So what would be your recommendation to how to select the target proteins 
since potentially the target proteins are different in each uh, individual? Yes. So um, that's, of course, a good question. And it, it addresses the deeper issue that we still, uh, while there has been progress, we, we cannot uh, measure every protein in every sample in proteomics. And that's a fact we have to, we have to accept. This is different from uh, next-generation transcript sequencing, where basically everything it can be sequenced in every sample with a reasonable amount of time. So, uh, the, what I would then say in, in response to your question is that if someone is studying a particular process, a biochemical process, for instance, metabolism, um, some signaling pathway, or whatever the case may be, then you generally know what the proteins are. And you can then ask what happens within this confined space using, for instance, techniques of, of, of SRM. And you will find new, uh, uh, new relationships between these proteins in a previously kind of by, by you confined space. So this is actually very valuable and should not be dismissed. Um, and we have a number of projects in the laboratory where we do exactly that with actually very interesting results, including uh, that one here. But you're certainly right that we, with, by having this somewhat myopic view, we do not recognize if something is happening in another uh, connected process. And so we think that this newly, relatively newly emerging DIA techniques um, like SWOTH or what uh, diagnosis calls hyperreaction monitoring, they go in that direction that we now get a more global overview but not a complete one. I mean, I think from cell lines, the number of proteins which can now be measured, quantified quite precisely, are in the range of five, six, maybe even 7,000. And, and in terms of tissue, the numbers are a bit lower because there's multiple uh, tissue, I mean, cell types and there's complications. So there probably the numbers would be in the range of two, three, four thousand, depending a bit on the tissue. So these this cover a fairly broad, not the whole protein, but a fairly broad level of, um, of proteins. And it's actually a really interesting question. We, we're discussing this intensely and would like to know the answer. What is, how many proteins do you need to measure to capture the relevant biological um, events in a cell? Of course, the simple answer would be everything. But we cannot measure everything. But the, there will be probably some form of diminishing returns. Like if you measure 100 proteins, you clearly miss most. If you measure 5,000 proteins in a, in, a, in a human cell, that's roughly half of the proteins expressed. And we, we, could, we could assume that at some level we cover probably most of the biology in terms of, of processes, not in terms of individual proteins. And these are the things we, we, we are keenly interested in, in answering is what is where, where is an optimum sweet spot? Is it as many proteins as possible, which usually comes at some level of noise? Is a smaller number of proteins very precisely measured? Uh, so we don't know the answer, but, um, but it goes in, in the direction of your question. Coming back to this fly wing project, I'm just curious whether the uh, authors of the study then came back to this all this this threads in between and checked whether the the phenotype is also intermediate or and whether that goes linearly or maybe there is some threshold and some bimodal uh, expression of all this inter of all these important players. And another question: Whether you actually made a mathematical model out of this study, or maybe of some other studies in your in your lab, and then connecting genotype with phenotype with, proto with proteins? Yes. So to the first question, I mean, there is basically a continuum of a bond. So it's not like two classes; either it's high or it's low. There's a continuum, and I think also in, even in these in these mice that were that are much more genetically, that the variability is much more constrained. We saw also at the phenotypic level, I showed these two graphs. It's basically a continuum. So it's not like there is a case where it's low and there's a case where it's high. And I think this is clearly an indication of, of, of complex relationships. So we can use this actually. It's actually desirable for associations. If you have a continuum, basically a, a range, and not just high and low, because if you had 
protein high and low, and, and let's say um, phenotype high and low. I mean, you can, there's either it's high and high and high, low or low and high, and you get very little information. If you have a graded, a range, then you have much more in information. So, so the, they are graded, and this is an advantage to do the, um, the association studies. Why they are graded mechanistically, of course, we, we don't know. Um, about models, that's what we, we try to, of course, work in that direction. We're not a modeling group, but we work with um, outstanding computer science groups who, who really try to develop models, and it turns to be very, very, very um, difficult. Um, so we have a number of data sets also from clinical cohorts where we have protein data, uh, transcript data, and also g genomic data. And we would like to make out of this data uh, through an integrated model, specific predictions. For instance, a project we are working on is we have intermediate prostate cancer cases. So these are pro people who have been diagnosed, have prostate cancer, but we don't know, or the, no one knows, pathologists also cannot see that, whether the person will develop the disease in a dangerous way or not. So it's an imminent clinical question. And what we're trying to do is, um, is to find molecular signatures by integrating various omics levels to make such a prediction. If you had then a patient and you could di was diagnosed, say, you are not, don't have to worry because you have a form of the disease which is not going to progress or, or you're in the other camp. And that turns out to be extremely difficult. And um, I mean, making slow progress, we learn a lot, but we certainly are not in a position to make such predictions. And of course, we would like to be able to do, make such predictions also from basic science point of view of these graded uh, phenotypes. I think it's going to be a while till this uh, actually works. Do you think that we're going to have to the point where you can have SWOT in the clinics uh, and, for instance, follow the same person across time and then be able to get back and check what was there before that we didn't search for and that could cause some specific disease and do this for uh, as many population as possible. But even if we do that, then the amount of data will be enormous and probably it will be difficult even to get um, more knowledge into actually the biology. So can you comment on this? Yes. So we certainly hope, there's certainly an explicit goal that um, we are pursuing, and I think others too, to bring these techniques closer to the clinic. And one particular ambition would be, uh, like we say, to follow patients. And I um, mean, at the genomic level, this is already being done to some extent. Um, at the proteomic level, not yet. We also would think that a really worthwhile goal would be in the field of molecular diagnosis. We, wor we work in, the, in this cause quite a bit with pathologists, and they, of course, are extremely skillful in recognizing patterns. But these patterns are oftentimes not sufficiently informative to then really make decisions. So in other words, different disease phenotypes can look to the pathologist identical. And, and of course, the expectation would be that molecular measurements would have information contain information that the pathologist uh, cannot recognize. Even for treatment response sometimes? Treatment responses, for instance. And so one of the, one of the um, requirements, then, of course, is that it has to be quite fast. And you, can't, you cannot uh, say, we're going to make a, a decision after three months of measurement and computation. So we have been trying to get pretty fast, and that's why we we work with this uh, PCT, this pressure cycling technique. So uh, a postdoc in the group, Tianan Guo, has been very active in this area. And now can, he can take a, a sample, a, let's say a, a biopsy, needle biopsy sample that is generated by a, by a clinician in the morning. Uh, he can co go the whole process to have a swath map in the, in the evening, so about after eight hours. And then, of course, if we had, uh, which we don't have, but if we had biological or clinically meaningful patterns, the, the search in a SWOT map for, for such a pattern would be very fast. That, that takes probably just a few minutes. So if, if these patterns exist and are actually reflected in the proteome part or segment that can be measured today, um, then 
uh, I think it would be realistic to to already uh, attempt to do that. For instance, to to say if someone who is freshly diagnosed with a particular disease within one day make a prediction, if the patterns exist, so we cannot do that now, but if the patterns predicted to say which which resistance or treatment options would be optimal. Um, so uh, the measurements also get better, measurements get faster, and so I think it is, it is realistic, and I would, I think this is an explicit goal that the uh, proteomics community should pursue. Okay, thank you for your attention. I wish you good course. <laughs>